We're excited to have Teresa Foxley here with her family. Uh, but before we introduce her, we have a few announcements. Following the leadership forum today, at 11.30, we'll have the Industry Insights panel. Uh, that topic will be uh, doing business in China. So we have some great presenters that have presented at Harvard and other great institutions. So even if you've never thought about doing business in China, they might be able to persuade you otherwise. The leadership forum next Friday will be at the same time, and that will be sponsored by the Utah Bankers Association. Following that, at 12 p.m., we will have the Network Etiquette Luncheon. Expert Candace Smith will be hosting a three-course meal and talking about the do's and don'ts of business lunches uh, and what, what, how we should conduct ourselves. So without that, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Teresa Foxley. So Teresa received her uh, degree in political science in 2004 from, the, from Utah State University. She received her JD from the University of Utah in 2008. She now works as the Managing Director of Corporate Recruitment and Business Services in the Governor's Office of Economic Development. However, her LinkedIn profile simply states she's the unabashed cheerleader of the state of Utah. Basically, she works to bring businesses here to the state of Utah. Uh, and she had a strong hand in bringing Amazon's Fulfillment Center here, uh, as many of you may have seen that. Uh, when she's not you know, wooing companies from all over the world to come to Utah, she likes spending time outdoors with her 105-pound Bernese Mountain Dog, her husband, and her 10-month-old son. So without further ado, let's give a Huntsman welcome to Teresa Foxley. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction. How are you? I'm going to dispense with the usual, hey, isn't it a beautiful day outside because I see that our windows are a little <laughs> dirty. They are getting cleaned this weekend. Even with a little, uh, a little rain splatter, it, it still is it's quite beautiful. It's still stunning, day. isn't it? Yeah. So, Teresa, this, this forum is, is about, uh, all about leadership. So let's start with your current leadership position. You're the CEO of the Economic Development Corporation of Utah, EDC Utah. So tell us what's your, what's your typical day? Yeah, great question. But before we do dive in, I would love to say thank you so much, Dave, for the you invitation bet. to be here. Thank you, Dean and Kathy, for, uh, for hosting us today. I really want to thank my mom, my dad, my 98-year-old grandmother for being here. That's just awesome. So uh, this is not a typical day for me. Um, and so it, it's really cool to be surrounded with friends and family in a, in a place that I love. So typical day, you know, um, maybe, maybe let me take it back just a little, just one level. So who is EDC Utah? What, what is EDC Utah? What do we do? Um, so EDC Utah is a private nonprofit. We were founded about 30 years ago with a mission to bring uh, jobs, quality jobs and capital investment into the state. And it really is one of the funnest jobs ever. Um, we've got a, a 14 member team that focuses on research and marketing. We try to position the state competitively to attract jobs and capital investment from outside the state. And then we have a business development team that works closely with companies that are considering expansions in the state and really acts as their, almost their customer service representative they, uh, or account management for, for a particular company. Um, so a typical day for me uh, might involve uh, working with a company uh, talking to them about Utah's value proposition, helping to under ask them questions and understand what it is that their decision drivers are as they're thinking about expanding in the state. Uh, a lot of times it's working with our membership. So our organization is, uh, as I mentioned, a public-private, so we work closely with the Governor's Office of Economic Development. We work with local communities who go to support our organization, and we work with the private sector who, uh, who has bought into our mission and believes that what we're doing benefits them. So it's a lot of stakeholder management, a lot of member management, a lot of board relationships, a lot of, um, and then a lot of internal conversations with our team on how we can change and evolve and, and do what we're doing better and smarter and faster and more efficiently. And um, so it's, it, there, there probably is no typical day. Yesterday I was in St. George uh, meeting with a couple of county commissioners and mayors and, and businesses down there. And then today I got to be up here. So it's statewide. Next week I'll be in LA. Um, so it's also a, a lot of external facing uh, opportunities as well. So no typical day, uh, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So let me deviate a little bit um, and, and uh, go back to your uh, earlier years. Where, where did you grow up? So I grew up in Salt Lake City. 
uh, went to public schools my whole life. Uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, I attended Utah State. Um, loved it, spent three years up here. Uh, it was the terrific three years for me and then went to, to law school at the University of Utah. I've spent a little time outside of the state in my career, but r realized pretty early on that I love this place. It's super livable and I never wanted to leave. So last year, some of you may, maybe were here when we did the same gig with your esteemed father who sat up here and called me sweetheart. Um, that's the highlight of my life. Um, so what, what, um, what early leadership lessons did you learn from, from your parents or from others? That is an awesome question and one that I get to reflect on a lot. But I think I was really lucky to have been raised by two wonderful parents and raised really though in a, in a beautiful community where we had a lot of involvement by church leaders and uh, school leaders and others, and I think the the biggest kind of lesson early on in life was was around integrity, and that was a big thing for our family, and that was a big thing in our church, and it's something that has then, you know, has really translates into the business world as well. Direct communication and be, and having a lot of integrity in the way that that you uh, present yourself and following through, doing what you say you're going to do. That's great. So at Utah State, did you have an idea what you wanted to do? For your career? I was pretty certain that I was going to be pre-med. Came up here and then took a political science class, Dr. Steve Lyon, I think he's still teaching up here, and I just loved it. Mm. And so within the first couple of weeks I had, had changed what I thought I was going to do, which, and I was undeclared at the time, and I said, you know what, I'm going to go into political science and then I'll pursue a, a degree in law, and I realized pretty quickly that um, in political science you could also you could also get that degree in three years instead of four, which I have no idea why I was in such a rush at the time. I, I now wish I would have been one, uh, more on the five-year track. But uh, I, I, I did come in here thinking that I would do medicine and ended up doing something entirely different. So. Organic chemistry killed it for me with pre-med. <laughs> I think that's a pretty common <laughs> refrain, yeah. right? That's the weeder class still. It's been that's the weeder right. class. That's since, right. That's right. And I got weeded right out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I got weeded out before I even took it, so. <laughs> so, um, so Teresa was USU's Woman of the Year uh, when she was here, so that tells me a lot, but a lot, uh, some of that is that uh, you were involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. How did you uh, get involved in some of that, and what did that teach you? Yeah, so I, um, I loved school. I loved, I, I could have been very happy going to class, going to the library. Um, but fortunately, early on um, in my collegiate experience, I was encouraged to, to rush a sorority. And I joined a sorority, and that really helped me get out of my comfort zone. Um, and so th in, through participating in the sorority, we got involved in a lot of philanthropic activities. And, and then it just kind of got me introduced to a lot of people on campus. So got involved in various organizations, um, was really involved in some of the political science groups, Pi Sigma Alpha, and uh, involved in the internship programs that were offered through um, what is now called the Institute of Government and Politics. At the time, um, it wasn't quite as, as formal. Um, but I loved, um, I really, I, I, I think I could have just been a total bookworm and a, and a nerd, but I was really lucky that I did end up joining this sorority that kind of pushed me outside of my comfort zones, allowed me to, to meet a lot of new people, and then got me involved in, in tons of different organizations. We started when I was here um, a group that was really focused on, it was actually kind of a lobbying and advocacy organization, but um, we started to, um, it, it was, con we were concerned with the international engagement and the lack, sort of lack of investment by the United States in some emerging markets from a humanitarian reason, and we sort of realized that there was a, an economic nexus to that as well, and so we, we started this, this club, and uh, I don't know if it's still going, but that was pretty cool. That got us, you know, it was fun to be on the ground level of things, and I think if there's one sort of thing I would impart to the students here, starting a club at Utah State is really fun and easy. I started an objectivist club, and uh, Dr. Fawson was our, our uh, faculty sponsor for that, and that was, 
uh, my politics have moderated somewhat since then. <laughs> uh, but it was, I, I, that's one of the cool things about being in college and something that I, I just, I loved about being at Utah State. If you were interested in something, there was either a club that already existed or you could go out and start one very easily and attract uh, other people that thought like you or who, um, or, or who challenged your thinking as well. Um, through being involved in clubs and extracurriculars. And I think that's something that makes Utah State really unique and different. Um, everyone sort of lived around campus when I was here. And so you could have an 8 p.m. club meeting uh, and watch a movie. Like we would watch the Ayn Rand <laughs> movies, <laughs> um, which are not good. You shouldn't watch them. Um, but but I, don't, I just don't think you can do that in other college settings. Um, it's a that's something that makes Utah State really unique. So getting involved in clubs, starting your own, um, finding faculty mentors that was a big thing for me when I was in college, and I was really lucky to have some good ones. So right. So from here, uh, University of Utah Law School, and then from there to to Ballard Spar, which is a law firm in Salt Lake. And let me just uh, quickly go through a little bit of your career journey from Ballard Spar. You had an opportunity to join MediConnect. Uh, which was going through an acquisition by a, a public company. And then back to Ballard Spar, right? And then you joined Governor Herbert's team at GoEd, and then now you're at EDC Utah, right? So take us through your thought process as you, as you went through uh, uh, these various jobs. Yeah, great question. So um, I think I have a little bit of a millennial in me, even though I, I'm not sure if I was born on which side of the, you know, the demarker for, for millennial, but in my career, I've always looked for t for three things. So one, do you like what you're doing? Two, do you like the people you're working with? And three, do you, are you comfortable with your compensation? Um, and if you've got two of those three things, you're probably doing really well and you ought, to, you ought to stick with that with that path. Even if those two things are just that you love what you're doing and you like the people. If you've got three, never leave. I mean, that's just pretty cool. Um, but when I uh, was making some calculated career moves early on in my career, it was around, one, I really loved, I loved serving clients when I was practicing law. And I loved working with my, with the, the, the fellow attorneys, but I didn't love, love practicing law. And I knew I wanted to, and one of the things that's sort of interesting about practicing law is you don't, you can have a very clearly defined legal strategy, and as an, out, as an outside counsel, you understand what the legal strategy is, but you don't understand, and oftentimes you don't get a full view into the, the business strategy and how the legal strategy plugs into the business strategy. So I really wanted to go in-house so that I could get that, so that I could get a little bit of a broader perspective, get on a leadership team, understand how the legal component fit into the overall business strategy. And so that was a calculated move that I, that I made there. And frankly, also made that move because the company was being led at the time by an incredibly dynamic um, individual who I knew would be a really, who, would, who I knew would push me really hard and who I knew would be a great friend and mentor and leader and somebody who would help me with my career and who would, who would invest in me. So that's another maybe, you know, just bit of unsolicited advice is if you can identify people in your own career that will take the time to mentor you, who will invest in you and who you believe in, um, it's, that makes work really fun and exciting. If I can stop you for one second, Teresa is talking about a woman named Amy Reese Anderson who will be here next month, uh, early next month. So I would highly to encourage you to go and listen to Amy. Yeah, she's, she's incredible. And I'm, I mean, talk about a leader who is just dynamic, who knows what she wants, who invests in her people, who lives a, who lives a life of integrity, um, and who's fun to be around. She's just, she's, she's incredible. So I sort of also identified that, you know what, I would really like to be associated with somebody like her. She's, she's incredible and she's awesome and, and, and she's remained a very close friend and, and, and somebody who I, who I, have a tremendous amount of respect for over the years. And then finally, um, you know, after we did have a very um, good exit and a, and a successful um, a successful exit from MediConnect, my thinking was, you know what, I've been really fortunate and really, really blessed through all of this, I, but I would like to now 
get into a, a role where I can give back to the community a little bit. And so um, that was sort of the calculated decision that I made then to go to the governor's back to the governor's office. And you were with with the governor's team for about three years. Three years. Yeah. How, and, and what was that? Can you describe that role? Yeah. So um, I was the I was the managing director of uh, corporate <coughs> recruitment and business services, and so helps to set the overall corporate recruitment strategy for the state, and then also um, that's what kind of gets a lot of the headlines, and that's what people read about and, and are, is exciting, but working on also making sure that we've got a great business environment and business services for companies that are already in the state and that exist here and that have challenges with hiring people or figuring out how to sell into the government or that want, ex want to expand their uh, horizons or their market penetration into international markets. So making sure that we also had a, a, an environment for um, companies not only to attract new companies in the state, but to help existing companies expand. So. And then from there, you're now at CEO of EDC Utah. Right. So, biggest cheerleader for the state of Utah. Yeah. So, it, sometimes, you know, we get into our little happy valley here and you forget the boom that's going on uh, in Salt Lake and, and the Wasatch Front. So, tell us what, what's going on in Utah. Oh, it just there. It's the most exciting time to be involved in in economic development. Um, you know, if you if you ever hear about our economy generally, you know that it is incredibly hot. Um, we've had three percent unemployment and three percent growth for a very long time. Our, and in certain parts of the state, that growth has actually been double the national average in terms of job growth and uh, and GDP expansion. A lot of that growth is being fueled right now by uh, by technology companies, uh, but certainly we've also seen a lot of growth in life sciences and in aerospace and defense uh, as well. A little bit of a contraction, of course, in, in energy with uh, with fuel prices or with oil uh, being what it is, a commodities-based market. And so um, even though we are seeing this tremendous expansion uh, in the state's economy, uh, that prosperity has not reached all corners of the state. And so that's a big uh, issue that we're, we're trying to work on. Our organization was founded 30 years ago by a bunch of business people who really realized and who were very intelligent about the fact that our economy was far too reliant on extractive-based industry and on construction. Um, and so when there was a blip in those markets, the entire state really suffered. And so this idea was, well, let's form an organization that goes out and markets the state as an attractive investment destination. Um, and let's try and diversify the economy. And fortunately, it worked for a bunch of different reasons. And our, I'd like to think that our organization played a part in that. And we're now, according to the Hatchman Index, the most uh, diverse state economy in the country. Well, we need to do that in our rural communities. Um, many of our rural communities are, are very reliant on, uh, on extractive-based industries. And that has um, given the, the um, the way that markets are so cyclical in some of those industries and given some of the, the trends um, in the macro economy, unfortunately, that's, that's just not working for those economies. So figuring out ways for them to create a bridge to something else, which may be tourism uh, and outdoor recreation, and I think that's a big strategy of the state is now investing in um, tourism and recreation assets so that some of those communities can transition from, uh, f from, a, from an older, uh, and less stable uh, form of an economy into something a little bit more modern. So, um, but I don't know if I answered your question totally. So what else is going on in the state that's really cool? Mm -hmm. um, FinTech, huge emerging sector in the state. What's um, FinTech? So it's the intersection of financial services and technology. Um, banking is being completely disrupted right now by apps, um, by crowdsourcing, by changes to the SEC regulations that now allow for crowdfunding. Um, and there are all sorts of new and interesting platforms that allow for when you guys graduate from here and you're graduating from Utah State, so kudos to you, you're not going to have a ton of student debt, um, but not all students throughout the country are. There are now new platforms that allow for investors to um, actually to re, um, to, uh, I'm, I'm losing the word, I don't know why, but basically you can refinance your student loans mm -hmm. and instead of having a, a bank that then takes that out and shops it, there's groups called SoFi and Earnest and Lending Club that allow investors like you or me to say, ah, oh, that student, I believe in them, I believe they're gonna be able to pay off their debt, I will, help, I will go to f help fund their student 
their student lending, their, their student debt. Same with housing and automobile loans and all sorts of other things. And um, Utah's perfectly poised to take advantage of some of this fintech growth. It's growing um, as an industry generally in the, in the country, uh, but we're really well positioned to take advantage of it because we do have such a strong financial services sector here. And we also have a really strong technology sector. A um, couple other kind of cool things that we're seeing where there is this convergence of centers of excellence or things where, where Utah has a competitive advantage. We're very strong in aerospace and defense. Uh, we're very strong in outdoor products. A lot of our outdoor, or a lot of our aerospace and defense strength come from the fact that we're really good at carbon fiber layup. And um, once you can build one component of an airplane with carbon fiber, it reduces the cost, it's much lighter, it's, it's more durable. It starts to build into other various different components of, of airplanes. Well, we're figuring out we can use that to build skis and ski poles and all sorts of other outdoor products. Hmm. Bike wheels, so NB Composites, you've probably heard of them. That's a total Utah success story, but if you watch the, the Tour de France, uh, many of the winning teams are riding on NB wheels, and that's a carbon composite wheel that's constructed right here in, uh, in Ogden, Utah. So super cool stuff. Yeah. Um, tons going on. I think from, a, from the student standpoint, the big takeaway is um, the world is just going to change. The pace of change is going to be so much, is going to be so quick. So having a really open mind about what your career might look like and then being adaptable to change and also being really, really fluent and conversant in technology. Now, many of you are business students, but you have to be tech savvy. You have to understand how to use Slack and how to communicate in different ways with your teams. You've got to be flexible. You might need to get comfortable with the idea of the gig economy and how that's going to change the way that you work. And you might work on um, the, this concept of a fluid workforce where you might go to work for six weeks for one company that's got a, a project and move on for four weeks to the next one and then take two weeks off and go be super parent at your kid's school. I mean, there's just, it, the whole world is changing. It's changing really fast. Um, but being conversant in tech and, um, and, and being able to transfer some of the business knowledge that you gain here into a technology-enabled world is going to be huge. So. From, from your position as CEO, what's your greatest challenge today? Um, just from an organizational challenge, the fact that we have a 3% unemployment rate in most places in the state means that we've had to pivot to our, um, had to pivot our organization to think about not only now are we marketing and selling the state, but also what does our product look like? Um, and so positioning Utah for uh, the next 10 years, which means working on uh, workforce development programs, working on interesting real estate concepts, and working for economic development preparedness two, three, five, ten years from now rather than um, I'm a very transactionally oriented person. I like to get things done on the month, on the quarter, on the year. And so looking out to that broader horizon has been a, has been a shift for us and it's something that we're really working on. And then, I mean, as an employer, it's it's being that person that people want to come to work for. So I'm really fortunate we're in a mission-based organization and our mission is one that gets people excited. It's jobs and capital investment. That's prosperity in this state. So it's, we, are, we have a competitive advantage in the market for bringing in talent because people want to come and work for an organization like that, but they also still get pulled into, you know, they come and they develop a lot of great contacts and that may mean that they, um, you know, that they may end up getting a, a more competitive wage offer somewhere outside of our organization, but showing them that we want to invest in them, that we believe in their, uh, in their professional progression within our organization, and that we're doing something that at the end of the day they feel really proud of. So. That's great. So if you wrap all of this up, what leadership lessons uh, from Douglas on forward um, do you keep close to you? So a few things. One is just in, is this integrity, this idea of, of really, um, it's, I know it's a, it, it has secular overtones, but my, my mentor, Amy Ray Sanderson, had on her whiteboard, do what is right, let the consequence follow. And she lived that way, and I'm trying to live my life that way, both in my personal life and in my professional life. So having a, living your business life as a life of integrity, 
um, being inclusive, being transparent, and communicating regularly and frequently and in a way that the people that you work with can, can understand. So we've got a ton of millennials on our team, communicating with them by email and by text and in forms that they respond to. And then for our, for our employees that have been in the workforce for a little bit longer, having an agenda for a meeting and sitting down with them and scheduling it and, and sorting through that. So really being adaptable and, and, uh, and communicating in a style that makes sense to the people that you're working with. So probably those three things would, would be my, my big takeaways. That's so, great. So. What are you most excited about? Um, I am really excited about what's going to happen in Utah over the next 40 years. So we have a ton of opportunities as a state. We already punch above our weight class in many respects uh, around the arts and culture and entertainment and outdoor recreation opportunities. Um, our population will double over the course of the next 40 years and that will just bring with it so many unique opportunities. Our community is going to change um, and we're going to have new ideas and a bunch of diversity and new thoughts that come into our community. Uh, but we have a lot to offer and so kind of this this opportunity that we have to to maintain what it is about that makes Utah great but to also mature um, as a market and as a state I think is, is really exciting to me. So. Is Amazon coming to Salt Lake? They'd be crazy not to. <laughs> <laughs> and the Olympics are coming to Salt Lake. If we're, we're going to win the Olympics, Amazon, uh, and a bunch of other really cool projects and it's going to be uh, it's going to be a fun 20 years. And then Gary Herbert can be governor forever. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So. Great. So what, uh, what's your advice for these students, given the, the tremendously bright future just in our state? I, I would, um, a, a few things. So one, you, you made a great pick in coming to Utah State. Um, in addition to the state of Utah punching above its weight class, I think Utah State really punches above its weight, its weight class. It's an amazing school. There's a lot of great colleges within the, within the university. Um, I had to be pushed outside of my comfort zone to get involved in extracurriculars. I had to be sort of pushed to do a study abroad and pushed to go on a, uh, to do an internship. But once I did, I loved it. So um, advice would be to take advantage of all of the opportunities that you can that are both scholastic and non-scholastic. And those will be the most enriching opportunities that you have. Whether it's the Huntsman Scholars Program where you get to travel and see new cultures and, and, and get the opportunity to interact with global businesses. That is so cool. But take advantage of these internship opportunities. One, they'll be more personally enriching for, two, for you. And two, they'll also make you a more competitive and a more attractive um, candidate in the workforce when you do graduate. So, And have fun. Like, I was kind of stressed out in college. I really, really, really wanted to get into law school, and I studied so hard. And like, thinking back on it, I probably could have phoned it in a little bit more and, uh, and, and still gotten into law school. And, um, and then. You know, maybe just one like sort of last thing would be keep in touch with your with your college friends. It's easy when you um, get married and have kids and maybe go to business school somewhere else and life kind of takes you takes you in all sorts of really fun and exciting directions and you don't know where those may be. It's it's it becomes harder and harder to stay in touch, but those college relationships are really enriching as well. And so um, and you go through a lot in your in your undergrad, you know, and you're up here at at Utah State and so have some fun stay in touch with your college friends and lean into the really cool opportunities outside of outside of school because if you get an A minus and you've got an internship that's better than getting an A and not having an internship so. do you have any recommendations for the how <laughs> uh, the how was pretty wild 13 years ago when I was up here I think it's, it's probably gotten even a little bit more crazy uh, don't take any props into the howl. Mine were confiscated my first year. I didn't realize that you could not bring props in. And so instead of being a ninja with some cool nunchucks and a, and a sword, I just had, I just looked like I was a shadow. So. <laughs> All right, let's, let's uh, have some questions from the audience. Great, thanks, Tree. So we want to open up to question and answer. So we have two mics on each side. It will be roaming. Just go ahead and raise your hand. We'll pass the mic to you, and you can stand and ask your question for Teresa. So I have a question. It was just mentioned about Amazon looking for new headquarters and w with your uh, department being in charge of those sorts of recruitments. I'm just kind of wondering what are like 
the processes that you go through when you're either trying to analyze whether or not you want Amazon to come into the state or how to get them to come into the state? Like, what are the, what are oh, the steps? Oh, that's such a good question. So kind of the nuts and bolts of a recruitment. So the state has identified six areas where we think we have a strategic advantage. And these are six industries where the wages are higher than average and they tend to create multiplier effects in the economy. So that's where we start. Is this in a strategic industry for us? And so that's financial services, life science, IT, aerospace and defense, outdoor products, and energy. Um, and so the first thing would be, are, is this going to be a net benefit to our community? Will, will there be either some great brand recognition that comes from it? Um, is it a competitive advantage for us? And will there be a good multiplier effect in the economy? So Goldman Sachs is the perfect example. They now have nearly 3,000 uh, employees in downtown Salt Lake City. Many uh, graduates of the Huntsman School of Business are, are now working for Goldman Sachs and having a great career there. Well, that has just changed and transformed downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, new restaurants, um, you know, if you look at some of the other multipliers effects, because those, those jobs are so um, well paying, it allows people to go out into the economy and, and buy more groceries and put their kids in daycare and um, all sorts of other things that, that lead to a positive effect. So that's the first thing. Are the jobs going to be such that, they'll, that it will be a net benefit to, to our community? And then are there going to be ancillary benefits? So we do go out and trade off of the fact that Goldman Sachs is here. And when I walk into a financial services firm or a fintech firm in, in New York with the governor, that's what you lead with. because. When you're inviting somebody to a party that you have, the first question that they have is who else is going to be there, right? And so that's that's what we lead with. Hey, we want you to come and be a part of the Utah party, and here's who some of here's who else is, is going to be there. So we really look to that. Uh, we look to you know the level of community engagement that co that that company may have had in another. Um, in, a, in another community, so are they investing in the educational system? Are they investing in their employees? Are they a good employer? Um, and then the nuts and bolts of it is, okay, let's say Amazon is a great example, and now people who didn't understand what I did before, Amazon has been the best thing ever because now people are really familiar with like, oh, okay, so you do Amazon, but on a smaller scale, right? So let's say they need to scale up to 50,000 employees over the span of 15 years, and they need five million square feet of real estate, just as an example. Um, we would go and work with our private sector partners to identify, op to identify real estate opportunities for them. Uh, and then we work on our team in that research and marketing vertical that I mentioned. We would go through and, and analyze how we can help them, what their labor stack looks like. So you guys talk all about capital stack here, right? Who's going to bring in the tax equity? Who's going to bring in the equity? How much debt are you going to do? What's your lever? Uh, we talk about talent stack. So how many employees is, is, or how many potential employees would Utah State University graduate? And how many would Utah graduate? And are there any technical programs that could go to plug in some of their other employees and put together what their labor stack looks like. What does immigration look like? Um, and then we put together a beautiful package and when we're doing our job right and it looks like a magazine and it's here are all of the things that Utah has to offer. And so that might mean a, a, a welcome letter from, from me or from the governor or from my partner Val Hale at the Governor's Office of Economic Development and then really, really deep analytics on how you would get from A to B in, in Utah. And it's usually going to be around real estate and labor. So, um, so just to give you some uh, an idea, so everyone's heard about this Amazon announcement. It's huge. Um, we will track about 130 projects in any given year. We'll close about 35. And so of those 130 projects, some of them will give us RFIs or requests for information that would be um, in, the, in a similar form than what you saw Amazon put out. So that here's my specs, I need 100,000 square feet, I need to be within, a, within 60 miles of an airport, I need my employment base to look like this, that, or the other. And then what we do is we put together a package for them that shows, okay, here's how Utah can meet your, your specifications. Um, and it's pretty cool. And that kicks off a conversation. And then from there, hopefully that company comes into town, we get to the opportunity to showcase uh, the communities within our state. Uh, we get the opportunity to have them uh, interview other employers so that they understand what the business climate looks like here and what their pain points are and how Utah's been able to solve some of those pain points, whether it's been, um, you know, lower cost of doing business here as compared to some of the other markets that they operate in or better talent base or more efficient or um, whatever the case may be. So it's super fun. It's a lot of kind of, um, it's it, it, but a, a big part of it is pulling the right partners around the table 
uh, to, to accomplish what, what it is that we've set out to do. I've uh, read a couple of articles and I've heard a lot of speculation that St. George is supposed to be like the next Silicon Valley in terms of technological companies and corporations moving in. Um, do you foresee that for Southern Utah and St. George? Or is that more going to be like a Salt Lake, Utah County area? So such a good question. For two, a couple of things. Um, there is in, in, in economics, and Dr. Vossen can talk a lot about this, sort of this clustering theory, which is that firms like to be around, like attracts like. So firms like to be around other firms that are like them. And if that's in aerospace, you look at Toulouse, France, and that's where Airbus is, is headquartered. Supply chains build up around it. Labor is able to move from company to company. It's generally pretty thought of as being pretty good for innovation. Tech is just disrupting everything, though, right? So we do have this great clustering effect right now um, going on along the, uh, along the point of the mountain. Um, but I do think that St. George can position itself with some really good opportunities. So St. George will, between now and 2065, will amount, will create, I'm not saying that right, St. George or the Washington County area will be responsible for 12% of the state's growth over the next 40 years. So of the 3 million people that are, that are expected to, of the 3 million people that we're expected to add, 12% of that will be, will be in St. George. St. George is doing a few things to position itself to take advantage of technology jobs. One, they're tr converting their, um, their college from Dixie State to um, a polytechnic institute. So they're- And the, some better name. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry, editorializing. <laughs> And so I think the, what you need for tech is first, of, first and foremost, you need workforce. So they're going to be, they're working to develop the workforce. And then similar to what's going on at the point of the mountain where the state has decided to move the, the penitentiary from there to the northwest quadrant of Salt Lake City, which is opening up this big real estate opportunity, St. George moved its, uh, its airport from the middle of, from that bluff in the middle of, uh, of downtown St. George. Uh, to an area a little bit outside of town, well, that creates another huge real estate opportunity there uh, that they're calling Tech Ridge. And so I am optimistic that between the population growth that's going to occur there, uh, a, a really now very good airport that can get people in and out of Silicon Valley and up and down to, to, to Salt Lake, and then with what's going on with the educational and real estate opportunities, that St. George could become uh, its own little mini tech, uh, t tech corridor. And they need it. Um, that's a big... That's a big um, you know, the, the, I mentioned earlier about how uh, the state has been pretty reliant or had historically been reliant on construction. A lot of their growth has been driven by construction, so they need to di diversify down there, and I would love to see that happen for them. So you talked about how it's important to stay up to date and be tech savvy. What are the resources that you use or suggest we use to stay up to date on all of those? Um, I, I read a lot of Twitter, <laughs> so following kind of Fast Company and Inc. and just understanding what new technologies are coming out in, in the workforce. So I think it's, um, you know, understanding how to use Slack and how to communicate with your team in that way. But really it's, it's just, it's staying up to date. You can never assume that, um, you can never assume that because you're doing something one way, that another iteration isn't going to come out and totally disrupt that. So, um, when I was when I was here at Utah State, the big cool thing was you could get an email from the New York Times, and at the time you didn't have to pay for it. It was before all of the uh, it was before all of the big publications went to a to a behind a paywall. But um, so that was kind of how I stayed up to date when I was a student was reading my New York Times email, and that was super cool. But now it's it's staying up to date through um, other platforms. And I think um, you're a technology nativist. You're, you're far more, you could probably tell me more about staying up to date on the latest technologies than I can tell you. I'm, sh I'm sure of that, but um, just being hungry for information and trying to find new ways to find it. So. We have time for one more question. Dean Anderson, have a question? I guess all the questions are staying in this area, but um, here in Logan we have kind of a unique uh, uh, situation because there's not a lot of room for growth. So what about uh, as far as expansion? So what are the uh, challenges and what are you doing to face to uh, address those here in Cache Valley? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, 
Cache Valley has a lot of the ingredients for, for success, and you're sitting in one of them. So um, if I think the dean can speak to this, I'm sure, better, better than I can, but if you look at really innovative and healthy economies globally, they're generally anchored by some kind of a, uh, some kind of a research institution, right? Because they're, they're doing research that creates new innovations uh, that then goes out and gets commercialized and businesses build around it and you have that good clustering effect that we talked about. So I think Cache Valley does have a really um, amazing opportunity for that through, through this university. Um, and there's a few companies here that are, that are doing really cool things, Innovar. Um, you've now got a, an outpost of Vivint up here. Uh, I could rattle off a few more. I don't want to exclude anyone because there's, there's some really cool, innovative companies here. But I think it is then being really smart about preserving some of what you do have. So if you feel like you're running out of land here, planning for uh, what you want that to be 30 years from now and not, uh, and not what you want it to be three years from now is going to be super important. And then having this university through the leadership of the deans and through the leadership of the presidents really engage with and lean into to this community uh, so that as things do commercialize and, and develop out of Utah State that there's a really strong connection between the workforce, between the business community and between the university here. So. Great, thank you, Teresa. We have a gift, a taste of Logan for you as oh. well as a Utah State onesie for your child. So please go that ahead and join us awesome. in thanking thank Teresa. You. Thank you so much. This is so cool. Thank you. Henrik needed this. That is awesome. You guys are so sweet. Glad you Thank like you. That. We'd like to invite you all to stick around for the Industry Insights That's panel. So cool. uh, we'll be talking about doing business in China. Thank you.